welcome back to another episode of the Core Consult RX podcast. Cole and I, once again, would miss an AJ. I know. She can't get the scheduling thing down. I know. We, we'll blame Valentine's Day, though. Yeah, we will. We had to adjust. We did. So it's probably Valentine's Day's fault. It's going to be interesting to see how we can coordinate this whenever he's on rotations in a very short amount of time. That's a good point. It's going to be tough. Is he in town? Uh, I for think most for of most them? of them, yeah. Plus, he's doing a lot of some. Some of the electives are research oriented, so I'm okay. sure those will be a little bit more easy on his schedule. Gotcha. Yeah. But worst case scenario, everyone listening, start trying to send me applications for the next AJ <laughs> if he becomes too busy to hang out with us anymore. But uh, don't worry, he won't listen to this. So <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> he won't know. If anybody asks, we were being nice. We have this whole campaign going whenever he's gone about replacing him, and he has no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we have some few options. Now, so uh, we're going to do uh, an episode tonight that is um, more centered around a drug class yeah. versus you know an overall disease state. We'll use a specific disease state for some, some context, um, but we're going to be kind of reviewing um, first and second generation antipsychotics tonight. And this is also an accredited episode. So uh, thanks to our friends over at FreeCE.com for partnering with us again. Uh, if you are already an unlimited member on FreeCE.com, then after you get done listening to this episode, there will be a super secret password that will be embedded somewhere in this episode. Um, I'm not allowed to tell you where because you have to actually listen to this. And um once you get that password and you've finished the episode, uh, go to the link in the show notes or log into your free CE account, and uh, you'll see a list of our podcast episodes that you can choose from. Select this one, input the code, and take our little post-activity test, and uh, you'll get one hour of ACP-accredited continuing education. So uh, big thanks to FreeCE.com. If you're not a FreeCE Unlimited member, definitely check out their website. They got monographs. They have live events. They have all kinds of uh, different opportunities for learning. And so um, definitely check them out. We have a f- several episodes on there now that are accredited. So good stuff. We really, really appreciate them continuing to partner with us as always. And here in South Carolina, we're coming up on pharmacist license renewals. We are indeed. Don't forget. Have you done yours yet? I haven't renewed it, but I've got like the CE I need. Yeah. Well, actually, they have a couple. I think I need to do like a control substance one or whatever. Mm. I still, I think we talked about this last year. I'm almost positive, but I wonder what the rules are on like us just doing our like our own CE credit. Oh, I don't know. Because I'm sure that counts, right? If we prepared I'd the imagine. material. But I mean, it could be more. It's not like it's hard to do other ones too. I know, but it would be funny just to see like the author of the CE and then a, you know, I had to do a bunch name. for an exam I took a few months ago. So I have like a million. Oh, that's right. It stinks that you can't carry them over for like a while. You know, I, I have to renew my CD, CES already. Yeah. And they were like, you need 120 hours or to retake the test. I, was, I will be retaking <laughs> the test. <laughs> I'm not about to do that many. It's every five years, right? Uh, something like that. But now you have to pay for it to renew it. Um, do you have to pay or like to take the exam? Is it cheaper if you like don't retake the exam? Probably. But I think that one was cheaper than like the BCPS and all yeah, that. Yeah. I can't remember how much, but yeah, I feel like it's got to be cheaper to paying for the test again than it would be to get access to however many hours that I probably should have been working on for. Is this your first renewal? Yeah. Man, time flies. I, I know, right? I remember when you got that thing. And then next year I had the BCPS and the year after I'll have BCACP. This? So I'm like three years of renewals. This is fantastic. At least they're staggered. Uh, yeah. I'm going to have to definitely just take all of them again because I have, yeah. Not enough CDs for anything. Each one's like 100 or 120 or something like that. It's too many. Uh, I remember uh, Dr. Ward said he didn't like to do this sometimes because he didn't always agree with the C. <laughs> so he just takes the test again. The C's would just make him mad. He, yeah, he just, I just take the test he again. He would just sit there fuming just at all the bad crush, information. Crush the BCPS with <laughs> He, he would fail all of. the quizzes because he would give the right answers because he disagreed with what their answers were. That was great. I'm making this up. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that was, that was uh, funny. I was like, wait, we can just retake the test? <laughs> Let's do that. So anyways, that's enough of that. Um but uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about antipsychotics. Like I said, we'll go through um, some background information about them. We'll talk about some receptor signaling that we've touched on a little bit in the past, but we'll get into a little bit more detail. Mm-hmm. And then we'll kind of just go through the individual agents and discuss, compare, contrast, all that good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we'll use schizophrenia kind of as a background because we want to talk a little bit about the symptoms. Um that the antipsychotics are targeting because a lot of them were created to target these symptoms. Um, so we know schizophrenia is a thought disorder. It has um, uh, a complex mix of symptoms. Um, as far as diagnostic criteria, they need a couple of um, different symptoms like delusions. Uh, we talked about this before, but they're erroneous beliefs um, with misinterpretations of reality, even if you give them evidence of 
uh, refuting that, that they still believe what they, um, their delusion. There's hallucinations, perceptual abnormalities, uh, that's usually sensory, disorganized speech. Uh, frequently, there's derailment of speech or incoherence. Um, their behavior may be disorganized or catatonic, uh, and then negative symptoms as well. And we'll talk about positive and negative symptoms. Yeah. And so what Cole was talking about as far as the hallucinations, delusions, all that, those are typically what we refer to as like overall like positive symptoms. And uh, so those all kind of fall under that category. Negative symptoms um, can be a, a mix of different things, um, you know, sort of a blunt effect. So basically patients have a lot of difficulty kind of expressing emotion. Um, patients even can have some issues with like speaking and, and remaining coherent Um in, in their sentences, but also just like sort of an inability to speak in general in, in more severe cases. Um, patients may have an inability to sort of um, experience like pleasurable emotions as well. So it's not just like the that blunt affect, but just also um, they're incapable of, of having you know, pleasurable feelings. Um, lack of desire or motivation to pursue like self-initiated goals. And then also, you know, patients may have this sort of un- inability and even unwillingness to participate in normal social situations because it makes them feel uncomfortable or um, just, you know, I've talked to patients where they say that it, uh, they feel like they can tell everybody knows that they're uncomfortable, even though it's probably not obvious to people looking, but they kind of get this sense of like, everyone's probably looking at me thinking I'm acting weird. And so they don't even want to put themselves in that situation. It's really tough, tough. I mean, all of these symptoms obviously are really bad um, and really detrimental to someone's quality of life, but uh, the, the negative symptoms as well, must be just very just so frustrating to have to deal with in a day-to-day you know um, sort of schedule so cognitive symptoms as well um, besides negative symptoms um, cognitive uh, impairment can also be issues so a lot of times um, patients you know uh, will have like almost like ADHD type um, symptoms where they have just you know very shifting uh, attention um, or you know they may have sort of like this uh, issue with retaining, you know, working or even long-term memory. Um, they may find it difficult to sort of um, acquire new skills. Um, skill acquisition can be difficult. Social cognition, as far as picking up on social cues, things like that, um, can can have uh, be a problem as well. And, um, yep. you know, everything down to mood symptoms, depression, um you know, hopelessness. Um, and then obviously this can impact our, like we say, quality of life and also their socioeconomic, um, status, you know, homelessness is really, uh, prevalent in the, um, in patients with more severe forms of schizophrenia. So it's definitely something that, uh, this is very detrimental. We want to be able to get these patients, um, on the right medications and get them back to living a, a normal life and as symptom free as possible. Right. Um, and there's other, uh, comorbidities or disease states that can cause similar symptoms that you have to be aware of that the drugs we're going to talk about may or may not be used for um, other psychiatric illnesses like schizoaffective disorder um, delusional disorder also anatomic lesions metabolic illnesses endocrine disorders like addison's disease other infections like neurosyphilis or hiv um, ms huntington's disease and then of course substance abuse um, issues like cocaine meth alcohol can um, have not all of the myriad of symptoms, but symptoms that might um, confuse the diagnosis. And uh, when we're thinking about treating patients, you know, for these type of symptoms, and, and the good thing with, with these medications is because of all the different targets that they're kind of going after, we, we use them in it, disease states that don't even have to deal with necessarily psychosis anymore. They can be depression with anxious distress, things like that, that we can use these as kind of like augmentation options. But all of them have kind of a mixture of different receptor signaling and different neurotransmitters that they're targeting. And so we have our three classic uh, neurotransmitters, like with our dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. Really dopamine historically has been kind of the main target when it comes to schizophrenia um, and partly with bipolar disorder. Um, we know hyperactivity in the, the in dopamine um, in the limbic system can lead to those positive symptoms. Um, hypofunction in the prefrontal cortex is thought to be, uh, when it comes to dopamine, is thought to be associated with negative symptoms. And then um, serotonin 
it's it's really it's not even the fact that the patient doesn't have necessarily enough serotonin. There might be some uh, issues with receptor signaling and whatnot. But one of the main targets when it comes to serotonin is actually the serotonin receptor. Um, so 5-HT, remember, is the abbreviation for serotonin. So 5-HT2A receptor. Uh, because when you have um, a blocking of that specific receptor, you can get um, an increased dopamine release in the prefrontal cortex. And you get this like sort of... Um, uh, anxiolytic uh, effects that you can uh, get from it. And actually there's some, th- there's some uh, drugs that have almost more binding towards 5-HT2A as an antagonist than they do a dopamine antagonist. And um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, glutamate is obviously another target that we kind of um, will interact with when it comes to these meds, acetylcholine. And then there's actually a couple of meds that are in the pipeline that um, are being looked at that have completely unique mechanisms. And uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how those uh, play out once they get approved. And so far, the preliminary data looks pretty good. So we can touch on those if we got some time. Yeah. All right. Want to talk about postsynaptic dopamine or something? Yeah, yeah. So uh, because historically dopamine has kind of been the main, you know, the receptor dopamine, the receptors, there's several of them. But um, dopamine 2 or D2-like receptors, which kind of includes D2, D3, D4, um, the postsynaptic dopamine receptors, which there's also D1 and D5 and, and postsynaptically as well, but D2 is usually what we um, sort of want to block because those are the excitatory um, and, and stimulate the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, and so we want to typically target uh, the D2 receptors to block those. Now, one of the new drugs we're going to talk about has a partial agonist activity at presynaptic D2 and then antagonism at postsynaptic D2. So as far as like why the difference there, um, there's actually a good, I'm going to put this on the uh, screen for those of you watching, um, but there's this kind of illustration here where the presynaptic um, dopamine, the D2 receptor is, a, is an autoreceptor. It's a gatekeeper, if you will. So when it's allowing uh, dopamine to be released, there's more dopamine in the system, um, then it's going to start binding to that autoreceptor. And at that point, it kind of shuts down the process of releasing more dopamine. So it's got like this negative feedback sort of loop because it, it is an autoreceptor. And so with a partial agonist, you know, you're getting a little bit of that dopamine or at least to shut down um, sort of the process of releasing extra dopamine. And then you're blocking the postsynaptic D2 receptor, which would be the target for the dopamine, you know, you postsynaptically. Yeah. And so you're, you, you want to actually get the, the body to, to activate that receptor because that's what shuts it off versus D2 postsynaptically. We shut down the excitatory function of it when we block it. Is that kind of unique mechanism? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you mean as far as the pre- That drug. Yeah, yeah, that one I think has. Now, now some of them do have, you know, some targets toward different mixed uh, dopamine receptors, but that one I believe is the one specifically for presynaptic and postsynaptic D2 gotcha. in particular. Um, but yeah, so the... The other thing with kind of dopamine signaling, you know, we, and we're going to talk about this in more detail, but one of the, the concerns with specifically um, having too much um, dopamine in the system is obviously the, the psychosis and those type of effects. But if we give a, a full you know, antagonist, we're basically like shutting down that receptor's ability to have any sort of function. And, um, you know, we, we kind of get this increased risk of uh, side effects, specifically almost like a Parkinson's situation where you can get um, drug-induced Parkinsonism or um, the uh, extrapyramidal syndrome, and prolactin levels can also go up, uh, and, but you also don't have the psychosis anymore. So the other uh, the kind of method they can use is using a partial agonist, which is a good balance between agonist activity and antagonist action. So it, it more so brings that uh, that activity down to more the, the in the middle range. It's not, you know, you're getting a little bit of release from it, but you're not actually shutting it down completely. So it's acting like there's no dopamine being released whatsoever. Right. Um, and so that's another target that that partial agonist activity is something that can be beneficial as far as hopefully cutting down on adverse effects and, you know, whatnot. Right. All right. So, um, and I'm almost done for those of you who hate uh, receptor signaling stuff, <laughs> but, uh, when it comes to five HT receptors, so there's a couple of them, um, that are 
typically targeted with a lot of different medications, even some of the newer uh, SSRIs um, that have other uh, activities for like Trintilix or something like that. Um, so 5-HT1A is one of the serotonin receptors that you typically want to have an agonist activity at. Um, that has been shown in the case of like schizophrenia, for example, to improve negative uh, symptoms um, and then cogn cognitive uh, issues as well um, and effective symptoms um, is, as well. So we want activity at 5-HT1A. Now, 5-HT2A was the one that I said has angiolytic uh, activity when you block that. Um, and so that you want antagonist activity, and that's a very common uh, receptor that a lot of these antipsychotics will target. Um, some of the other ones will have some extra activity where they have an agonist or partial agonist at 5-HT1A, and that's just adding even more um, sort of uh, ways of shutting down that um, those feedback loops and whatnot. And then uh, the, the last one I'll mention is 5-HT7, which is sort of a, a newer um, target, I would say. Not new, but relatively, I guess. And 5-HT7 uh, is um, typically going to um, be an excitatory uh, receptor that um, interacts with GABA. And um, when we block that, we can kind of shut down um, some of that release of uh, and some of the downstream effects of that excitatory um, process. So that's another one that we kind of target now is, is another serotonin receptor specifically that we're, that we're going after. I feel like you don't get this in the classroom too much. I feel like you get like, yeah, antipsychotics act on dopamine, yeah. maybe some serotonin. And so this is my thing with it because I, I get why they can't go through a lot of this stuff in the classroom. It's, you know, for day to day, like just knowing, being familiar with the drugs, if you're not working in psych or whatever, then it may be not that relevant to you to right. know the receptor signaling. However, the, at least how I learn things, I feel like I need context in order to just, instead of just memorizing things. Mm -hmm. And so for me, if I can kind of keep track of the signal or the receptors that it's interacting with or the neurotransmitters it's interacting with, as far as memorizing all the different side effects and things like that, I can kind of Feel, I feel like it's easier for me to keep right. track of which drug goes what and what I would expect to do what. Because it makes more sense. Yeah. It makes more sense. Instead of just saying this side effect is associated with this drug. Yeah. Whereas this, we said this other drug acts on D2, but it doesn't have the side effect. It, mm -hmm. There's there's more going on. And in in, depending on what the patient has, you know, as, as far as comorbidities, things like that, it may help you make a better decision of choosing one antipsychotic over the other if you are familiar with the receptor signaling. Yeah. You know, so... And that's just my two cents. I, I've I've gotten a kick of these uh, receptors lately. You're all about the receptors. I think it's it's interesting. There's, yeah. just, there's so many that are involved. We didn't even touch on you know a quarter of them. So it's, it's always comes back to serotonin too. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's because serotonin can directly like you know work on the release of norepinephrine, dopamine, and other you know acetylcholine, all these other neurotransmitters. So it's kind of a, a key yeah. key factor. It's kind of why I guess we start with SSRIs a lot of the time. Yeah. But anyways, so that's uh, that's what I got for some of the receptor signaling. We're going to be talking about the receptors you know, with the specific drugs as we go. But uh, You want to start with the... Um, first gens? Start with the first gens. Yeah. So um, we've we mentioned, we've referenced their um, mechanism of action here, but they're going to block postsynaptic, primarily postsynaptic D2 receptors in the mesolimbic area, uh, possibly the mesocortical area of the brain. Um, they're stratified based on their potencies, which is really their um, how likely they are to um, cause uh, side effects, which we'll talk about. But there's low potency, there's high potency, and their adverse effect profile is going to differ based on their potency. Um, low potency, um, there's concomitant anticholinergic effects, antihistaminic effects, serotonergic effects, and alpha adrenergic, adrenergic blocking properties. Um, high potency there's less potency at those other receptors, but the extra parental side effects are going to be more uh, pronounced and more prevalent than the low potency agents. Yep. So some of those are chlorpromazine, flufenazine, haloperidol, loxapine, theoridazine, uh, probably the primary ones that you would see, uh, but there are a couple of older ones, perfenazine and theothixine. Those are all first-generation antipsychotics. Besides haloperidol, which of those of you... Seen patients on? Uh, I've seen patients on chlorpromazine. Isn't that the one? That's the one you can use for like hiccups and stuff, right? That's probably why. I feel like I see the the chlorpromazine for like um, 
when they come into the the ED with like a migraine or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, so yeah for no, nausea. And, cocktail, like yeah. in a cocktail. That's where I've seen that. And then I want to say I've seen flufenazine before. So I had a patient the other day that was on loxapine. What's the, I think I've it was literally the, the first person I've ever seen what's on the brand loxapine. Name for loxapine. I honestly couldn't even tell you. Um, but yeah, it was the first person that I've actually seen that they were on um, that particular drug. I mean, I'm sure they use it plenty. I don't, you know, work in psych every day or anything right. like that. But uh, it's just surprising because I feel like that's the first time I've seen it. I see halipuridol still quite a bit. Right. Uh, yeah, I want to say I've seen loxapine, which the brand name is Atasuve. I don't know. Never yeah. heard that before. So, and that's, that's probably before our time. When was that FDA approved? Do you have Lexicon pulled up? Yeah, I can check. But uh, I feel like I'm going to say, I'm going to sound stupid because I have no idea when these things <laughs> came, when these came out. Uh, it's not that old. Oh, really? When? 2012. What? I thought it was a newer one too. Oh. Why would they make a, it's a first, yeah, that's weird. Okay. Know. Anyways. So, uh, like Cole mentioned. At, the at um, a souve. At a souve. Hmm. At a souve? I don't know. It, it's spelled like suave. You know how suave mm-hmm. is S-U-V-E? Yeah. A-D-A. Swath. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So they come up with these crazy spelling. I tell you what. <laughs> it's making it real hard for me for me <laughs> to pronounce stuff. So uh, Cole mentioned EPS um, as far as like those sort of movement disorders, and I, I think we've talked about this as well. But EPS, I feel like, and you hear a lot of people talk about that they don't really like that term, uh, extrapyramidal sy- symptoms, because it's kind of like this umbrella term that everybody lumps all of them together. So you say, oh, the person's having EPS. That doesn't really tell us right. what to do about it because they're all different. You can treat them all differently. So, for example, um, the tardive dyskinesia is probably the one that the majority of us are familiar with, and that kind of results in this like sort of stiff, jerky movement of usually the face, and also it can happen in the body as well, but um, usually you can uh, kind of notice it in the face. Um, agathesia is, is a, the feeling of inner restlessness. And I've actually had a, a patient one time that was having that due to, uh, aeropiprazole and s- described it as f- feeling like they need to, um, like pull their skeleton out of their, their body is how it was described. It's very Which, unpleasant. Pretty, yeah. It sounds, sounds very, uh, like not fun. Cole's just working with his, uh, microphone over here. <laughs> what is it? Is where's it? It's probably this one up here. You think so? The, uh, okay. Where's it falling? Uh, it's down there. Is it? And we're having some microphone arm issues. Yeah, the way I heard it described was always ants in your pants. Like you, I think we watched a video that was kind of compelling in our psych <laughs> lecture. That was um, uh, a guy who just couldn't keep his legs still. Like they were just moving all around. I can hold it. You got? It? Yeah. They were just moving all around. Like he had ants in his pants or something. Yeah, ants in his pants sounds a little bit more uh, PG. The, uh, <laughs> um, this is, this, this microphone's totally distracting me now. It's so, because it's, it's always like some kind of like technical difficulty. This is just his one. <laughs> the, the, the physical thing just falling. This thing just falling in front of him. That's funny. Um, so dystonia is another type of, uh, movement is where they can come under uh, EPS. So that would be like where the muscles contract uncontrollably. Um, the contraction causes the, the affected body part to sort of like have this twisting motion um, that's involuntary and you get this sort of a like repetitive movement, um, ab- abnormal posture as well. Have you seen that before? Um, not in person. I've seen clips of it describing it. I saw a guy, he was older and I think he had like dementia, uh, but he was also taking antipsychotics and his, his neck was just like completely contorted in an extremely uncomfortable position. And obviously he couldn't move it, but it was, it was, um, a dystonic reaction hmm. and it just looked horrible. It, so it was like involuntary that he was moving or was it actually painful or anything? Um, I mean, I think that it, he had gotten used to it, but it was, it was, it looked very uncomfortable. Yeah. No, I, uh, I've actually, um, I, I messed up my, uh, my neck doing something. And, uh, so I've been constantly moving my neck like this for a while while it's been healing. So people probably think I have some kind of <laughs> movement disorder. It is um, amazing. A crick in the neck can just oh, take you out. And it makes you so angry. I know. It's horrible. <laughs> like, I can't believe this hurts so bad. But, uh, yeah, that's been fun. Um, the last one uh, we'll mention is Parkinsonism. And that's kind of a combination of, um, movement abnormalities that you would see like with Parkinson's disease. So like bradykinesia, rigidity, tremor, those type of things um, are all, you know, what we'd expect. So again, it's important to kind of be able to differentiate between, I mean, obviously, you know, knowing the difference between them, because it's going to affect how we treat them uh, and, and manage those symptoms. Uh, and also it's not all of the antipsychotics 
we'll we'll have the same risk for all of the different types of EPS. So like aripiprazole might be more on the agathisia side right. versus others maybe tartar dyskinesia. And so it's that's why a lot of times you'll hear people say that no, they don't really like that umbrella term. Right. It's very undescriptive. Right. They need to know what side effect they're having and, and then, which meds. And what to do about what it. What to do about it. Um, but those are not the only side effects of antipsychotics. Um, they are they do tend to be prone to side effects. So uh, we're still talking first generation, uh, but sedation uh, is common. The degree of sedation depends on the drug. If it occurs, it's usually worse at the beginning of starting to take it, um, and then it could be better tolerated over time. And it does tend to be dose related. Of course, higher doses are going to cause more. Um, kind of along with that, uh, but different is the anticholinergic side effects. Uh, we know to be dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, urinary retention. So those can occur too. Um, for these patients, um, the, the effects may be a problem. Um, if, if those are a problem, then a high potency agent might be better for them. Cause we mentioned that those side effects are a little lower in the high potency agents, but you get the higher risk for EPS symptoms. Uh, also anti-adrenergic effects, like we mentioned, um, like orthostatic hypotension. I always think of Seroquel with that one, mm-hmm. which is, of course, the second generation, but yeah. I feel like it can cause that as well. Yeah, and, and like looking at all these two, I, it's kind of one of those situations where it, is makes, it makes sense when you talk about all the different receptors. That's why I like, said I like these, because with sedation, you know it's because it's interacting with uh, and blocking histamine 1 receptors. Um, anticholinergic, we know it's interacting with um, muscarinic receptors and um, blocking acetylcholine. Uh, it, it's interacting with norepinephrine and um, other aspects of the alpha androgenic system. And so it's something that uh, when you start to kind of look at all these different receptors, you realize why they have so many side effects because i feel like that's one of the questions that patients will ask is like you know why is a drug like this that's supposed to be helping the mind like have so many side effects associated with it and it's because it's it's going to be hard to only target you know one specific receptor without having any interaction with other receptors right um so some uh some other adverse effects that can kind of be applied and, and we'll go through um the difference with these as far as you know the likelihood of because not all of these are going to cause the or have the same risk of these side effects to the same degree and that's kind of why the a lot of the selection of antipsychotics is very patient specific because some you know may be better options for others depending on what comorbidities and all that good stuff um, but uh, one potential like you know very serious complication with with antipsychotics is uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome um, and it's something that can occur with all of agents but uh, does tend to be more common with high potency first generation um, uh, antipsychotics it, the symptoms basically look like agitation, confusion, um, changing levels of consciousness, fever, tachycardia, um, and then, you know, the drug obviously needs to be stopped and, you know, the patient, um, getting supportive care. And that's rare, but it um, could definitely yeah. be life-threatening and generally would yeah. warrant an ICU admission. And they don't really know why or who it happens to. It's kind of random. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, as far as diagnosis, I mean, you can imagine you've got a patient who has, you know, symptoms of schizophrenia and they come in with like some kind of strange neurologic symptoms you, you might just chalk it up to the schizophrenia but you need to be aware that it could be nms mm-hmm. um it only occurs after an exposure to a neuroleptic drug on average the onset is four to 14 days after the start of therapy but 90 percent of cases would start within 10 days of therapy so i think that's important because that wasn't something i realized yeah so it's going to be pretty soon after they start a new medication um but it can occur at any time years in the therapy um, but when it starts, it's usually over within 24 to 72 hours. And there's not really much they can do except for supportive care. You, you go into the ICU and they might m- manage your muscle symptoms. rigidity and your hyperthermia and your symptoms and, um, you know, go from there, go from there. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, weight gain is another concern with some of these agents, uh, especially with the low potency first gens or some of the second generation. Um, weight gain is uh, definitely a factor. Um, that actually has something to do with kind of like the same mechanism of, uh, um, there's a couple different mechanisms, but one is like, just like with mirtazapine where you're blocking 5-HT2C, um, when you block that, the appetite tends to be ramped up. And so the, that serotonin receptor signaling, that's one of the receptors that also gets blocked. 
blocked, um, just like it will with mirtazapine and the, the appetite goes up. Um, sexual dysfunction, so, you know, not just erectile dysfunction for males, but also loss of libido um, can happen, um, inability to, to orgasm, for, and that can happen both men and women. And so that can be obviously um, hard on someone's quality of life as well. Uh, QTC prolongation is uh, a concern with certain meds. So a lot of stuff to think about. Um, I feel like one of the hardest things to kind of get your head around is looking at the chart of all the different antipsychotics and trying to figure out, okay, which one is going to be a best you know option for this patient based on all the different potential risks and things for that agent. Because right. there's so many things to think about. And, you know, you would think in a case of um, schizophrenia, it's obvious that the benefits would outweigh the risks. <clears throat> but these are used, you know, in a lot of other instances where – you kind of have to make a decision with the family whether the benefits do outweigh the risks. For example, um, patients with dementia with behavioral disturbances. Um, we know that antipsychotics have a black box warning for, um, what is it, delirium or death, basically, mm-hmm. uh, for elderly patients. So you're cautious about starting antipsychotic in a patient. But then a lot of times they end up with delusions or hallucinations or behavioral issues because of maybe they have dementia or memory disorder um and you have to consider starting one of these and you have to have that conversation with the family that this is uh, a risk uh, not only because of all the side effects you could have but because of the patient's age is that going to outweigh you know the benefit or is the benefit going to outweigh that risk of treating these behavioral issues and hallucinations and things like that so yeah i mean it seems like of course they got schizophrenia we're going to start them on an antipsychotic agent but there's some conditions where these are used where it could kind of i don't know yeah go either way no, absolutely. And uh, I'll show you this comparison chart right here on my screen for those of you watching the videos. Um, so these are the first generation antipsychotics like we were talking about. And as a rule of thumb, the, the more high potency, because again, the main target that we're going after is the dopamine, the D2 receptor. So if the, when they say high potency, they're talking about high affinity for the D2 receptor versus other, you know, H1 and all these other um other receptors that can be involved. Um, so like helipuridol, for example, has a high potency. Um, and it's, so when we think of like the dopamine related side effects, specifically EPS, then you're going to have a high risk for EPS because it's a high potency, um, antipsychotic. Whereas the anticholinergic, the sedation, the um, orthostatic hypotension, those are going to be less severe because um, the affinity of that drug is on more so on the dopamine receptor. It's not kind of spreading itself over uh, and interacting with those other receptors. Whereas looking at something like um, chlorpromazine, it's considered a low potency. So you're going to have like, you know, a very high likelihood of anticholinergic, high likelihood of sedation, orthostatic hypotension, but then that risk of the dopamine related issues. So EPS is, is not going to be as significant. So it's definitely uh, one of those things that you have to kind of, again, pick and choose based on comorbidities and whatnot. Um, but, you know, if, if we're thinking only along the lines of the dopamine pathway, as far as curing the symptoms, then obviously the high potency seems like it'd be a better choice. But now we're starting to see that you may need some other receptor activity to really get the most bang for your buck and mitigate some of those side effects. Right. Um, but yeah, so then there's even dose equivalence. So if you're trying to change from one agent to another, um, obviously if you're changing from a low potency to a high potency or vice versa, then that's going to change side effect profiles, all that stuff. But they do have dosing equivalents that you can utilize if necessary. Yep. Um, and of course, first generations are going to be generally these days, like we kind of mentioned, use less. Yeah. In the second generation. It, it's, it is interesting because I feel like a lot of times, and I don't know if it's a, it's a cost thing or something, but I know that like there's one um, mental health facility that I, that's a local one that I, I see mostly first generation antipsychotics prescribed out of there. Um, but then other, you know, like some of the bigger places, like, you know, the, I'll see the, a lot of the a mix or mostly second gen. So it's, in, it's, I don't know if that's just a, clinician specific thing or they're just worried about the cost of these because i mean some of these are their brand name obviously could have a cost factor but there's also plenty of cheap options for second gens as well mm-hmm. so i don't know do you, do you feel like you see that as well or like from your I mean, patients i guess i i'm surprised at the number but i still i mean i do personally see mostly second generation yeah. but um i don't know i don't yeah. know why that would be i'm just always surprised by the when i see especially like i'll see patients that are on two different first gens mm. um so it's just kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's always a story there. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be cost. It could be 
response could be that they tried yeah. second generations. Yeah, you know? well, that's true because they are technically speaking going by this because are supposed to try a first and a second generation before you know escalating or mm-hmm. starting to get fancy. Yeah. So I mean, technically, if the second gen's not working, you could try it first. Man, and I know for epilepsy, yeah, people are all over the board with what they end up trying before something can work in some instances. So it very well could be the same with the schizophrenia. It's one that's, I feel like neurology and psych when it comes to pharmacotherapy is probably the two hardest. Yeah. Ish, like, I mean, I mean, there's plenty of hard stuff with oncology and whatnot too, but I feel like with, if I give someone a, you know, a thiazide diabetic or a calcium channel blocker for their blood pressure, it, regardless of who they are, it might not lower it to the same extent as, uh, you know, somebody else, but it's, it's going to lower their blood pressure right. versus I can give a patient who has schizophrenia a medication that for somebody else took away their symptoms entirely, give it to that person and does nothing for them. Exactly. And then I give, you know, it's, you have to like, almost like, it yeah. feels almost like you're throwing a dart at the wall. Obviously there's a lot more, um, method to it than that but for the patient it, i know it's a frustrating thing too sometimes it is like that i mean you give someone a statin yeah. it's probably going to lower their mm-hmm. cholesterol yeah you give someone metformin it's probably going to lower their um blood glucose so what you're you're working with there is mostly related to like patient specific issues of cost and side effects and things like that but with neurology kind of not all yeah i guess not all neurologic diseases but especially psych um and epilepsy and migraines is what comes to mind um you don't know how they're going to respond yeah. And they could just not respond right. at all to this drug that a certain percentage of people respond very well to, mm-hmm. which is so strange. And then you have to go to the next thing and then go to the next thing. It's just constant switching of drugs. I'm surprised that with that being said, pharmacists aren't as involved in outpatient neurology. Because, I, I mean, they it exists. There are pharmacists who work in, in outpatient saying, neurology. That's what you do, right? <laughs> yeah, but it... it but like, like I, I work with a very specific subset of drugs for the most part, yeah. right? So we don't really have a pharmacotherapy AM care mm, pharmacist I see am. working in outpatient neurology. So like mm. we're the ones, even though we work primarily with specialty medications. Um, but then in primary care, you know, pharmacists are all over the place. Maybe that's because with, um, if you have kind of, you know that you're going to kind of go through this algorithm and depending on their comorbidities, you don't use this or do use this. It's easier to come up with a collaborative practice agreement with a, provider mm-hmm. but maybe you know maybe with neurology it's more it's different there are a few things you can start with but also because you know we're treating them for migraines but they could have some like really weird neurologic issue going on that yeah. maybe if a pharmacist was the only one looking at them yeah, would yeah. miss because they're not trained to diagnose something like that for sure know, yeah no i mean i agree and especially yeah from the diagnosing standpoint for sure because that would be where i would I, you know that that's where i know where my weaknesses you know lie so i, I feel like it would be something where the patient, the patient's been, they've established the diagnosis, at least in my experience, like doing some psych consults with our psychiatrist at my old job, we, it would be like they had an established diagnosis. However, they just couldn't get the right, you know, medications on board for that patient. And that's so I, I was given the diagnosis and I was could come in and like mess with the, you know, kind of like I would with any other mm-hmm. disease state for pharmacotherapy. But, um, you know, I, I think that that definitely is a, is a, is a sweet uh, opportunity even for with pharmacists. Psych, we can be... You know, I mean, I, I guess you can have a definitive diagnosis, but then, like, you can end up having, like, bipolar with, like, mixed features mm-hmm. and things and kind of start to look different as time goes on. I mean, of course, with any pharmacist seeing a patient, the provider's going to see them as well. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess maybe it's just a little less cut and dry. Yeah, I mean, I do I do feel like the that whole, uh, like, sort of, like, just trying things to see what works on that patient. Obviously, there's a, like I said, there's a method to it, but I do feel feel like when I'm talking to patients, especially if they've gotten to me and they've already tried six different things with their primary care, their Mm -hmm. psychiatrist, I almost spend like a good five minutes or so explaining that to them. And I've used that analogy a bunch about blood pressure meds are going to, everyone's going to blood pressure going to go low, but everyone's different when it comes to the psych meds. And I feel like that just actually just saying that and like getting that elephant in the room out of the way uh or whatever you want to call it okay kind of like helps sell your your uh yeah, that it gets the buy-in from the patient it when sets expectations when they're frustrated about having to switch because right. i i know i if i didn't know anything about medicine the guy that i'm trusting with my overall health is just picking and choosing things at random i'm gonna be like yo <laughs> <laughs> but it's unfortunately the nature of it yeah so um, before we jump into second generation into psychedelics, this would be a good time to oh, reveal time. reveal the password for the post activity test. This does not mean you get to stop listening right now and just go take the test, even if you could pass it, because that's cheating. 
You got to be oh, honest. Oh, you totally fail it because our tests are super hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, we're going to make the password dopamine, all uh, capital letters. Um, so when you go to the post-activity test, dopamine will be the password, all caps. It'll let you in and, uh, you know, you take that test and get your credit. Nice. Yeah. All right. Second gen. Second generation antipsychotics. So they, of course, are also known as atypical antipsychotics. With these, the overall risk of EPS symptoms is lower than the first generations or the typical antipsychotics um, at the usual clinical doses. The risk of tardive dyskinesia is reduced. Um, then the ability to block the serotonin 2 receptors is present, like Mike went over the with the 5-HT2A. 5-HT2A. Um, yeah. Um, so this could specifically target and improve activity for the negative symptoms um, in schizophrenia in particular, but negative symptoms in general. Um, and then, of course, reduce the risk for, for EPS. So uh, where do you want to start with these? Because there's a lot to go through. Yeah, we can start with um, the big scary one, clozapine, clozaril. Um, it was the first atypical antipsychotic, um, and it's indicated for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Um, treatment-resistant would be um, a lack of response to two or more adequate trials of antipsychotics, um, with one of those being a first-gen and one being a second-gen, kind of like Mike mentioned before. Um, it's the only antipsychotic indicated to reduce uh, suicidal thinking in patients with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. Um, and it's very low risk for EPS and uh, tardive dyskinesia. Overall, it's a good drug, um, except that it has this um, um, kind of annoying issue of causing severe um, neutropenia, known as agranulocytosis. Um, it has a, um, there's several U.S. box warnings um, related to this. Uh, there's a REMS program uh, involving it. Um, agranulocytosis is defined as an absolute neutrophil count of less than um, 500 microliters so, cells per microliters 500 cells per yeah. microliter the, the note that i gave cole was we had a <laughs> had a uh, missing info um it has some other side effects but the rims program is really what limits its use and, and for those of you who haven't messed with um cause pain in a while uh their rims program has changed now so it's now www.newclozapinerems.com and you i'm have guessing to, the other one was Clozapine rims. I think so, yeah. Um, but then, yeah, I, I, if I remember correctly, I think you're spot on. <laughs> um, and now it's old clozapine rims. Yeah, they had to switch the URL. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this website, like, you have to go and get registered. Uh, and if you're in an ambulatory tar- care role, um, you can get registered as, like, a, um, I forget the term that they use, but if you, it's like a, an authorized signer for the provider to put in the labs and stuff. Uh, and then the, Provider has to do the labs um, and upload that uh, absolute neutrophil count. And then the pharmacy also has to log in to that website and make sure that the provider's actually done that. Um, where we've run into problems, at least in my experience, is when a patient comes in the clinic and they've been on clozapine for a while, so they're only having to get their absolute neutrophil count like every four weeks. And they see a provider for the first time and they just continue their meds. Uh, they're not familiar with clozapine. They're just continuing because their old psychiatrist said that, and so they feel comfortable with it. And the patient goes to the pharmacy, can't get it, and then it's you got a problem. Yeah. So making sure that's a, a important thing if you're working in a setting that maybe doing that with providers that aren't familiar with clozapine, um, <coughs> just uh, make sure they're aware. Because then I, I remember uh, something like that happened, and the, they were mad at the pharmacist. Pharmacist was mad at us, and I was like, oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> everyone be nice to every, everybody. Love everybody. <laughs> Yeah, but, so right. that definitely limits it to use. But I, I mentioned other side effects, um, orthostatic hypotension, bradycardia, syncope, um, potential for cardiac arrest. It has specific dosing and titrations. Um, so it's initiated at 12.5 milligrams once or twice daily, and it's increased slowly um, given in divided doses. Interestingly, it has a risk for seizures. Um, it's dose-related and can be minimized by um, the slow titration. Also myocarditis and cardiomyopathy, and then weight gain, um, which is what you'll hear a lot with the second generations, uh, as well as sedation. Um, so it still has a number of other side effects, but as far as its effectiveness and risk for the side effects associated with first generation of psychotics, it has a good profile in that way. Yeah. And which is why, because you might say, like, why would anybody go through all that REM stuff? to use it and it's because it's effective it's a really effective drug and and in fact the uh i think we did an episode in the 2020 um guidelines for schizophrenia management and anyone who's got schizophrenia that also is having any kind of suicidal ideation goes right to 
clozapine. So it, it, it does have a, a good, you know, effect on patients. Um, all right, so then we'll talk about the uh, the azoles, but not uh, not what we think of as not the antibiotics, not the or the antifungals, um, <laughs> the uh, aripiprazole and bextiprazole are the the two. So aripiprazole um, has a little bit of a unique um, mechanism. It's uh, a dopamine um, agonist and then or a D two antagonist and also a, uh, a serotonin five HT one A partial agonist. And so remember we said one A we want agonism activity and then we want antagonism at five HT two A. Um, and so you also get five HT two A blocking with aripiprazole as well um, because it's a uh, it's a partial agonist. Um, and I, I said antagonist of dopamine. It's a partial agonist of dopamine as well. Um, the, the, the two receptors. So the the risk of EPS is a lot lower than it is with other antipsychotics. Um, in, in fact, really tardive dyskinesia is um, very, very low risk. The one exception to that would be um, it does have a moderate to high incidence of akathisia specifically. Um, and I have actually unfortunately run into the situation with a patient uh, where we had to lower the dose. It went away and the patient was able to stay on the medication but um, did develop that um, akathisia with it. Um, it is available as a long-acting injectable uh, depot as well. Um, and then it's it's a different drug, but I like to call it its cousin just because they 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 uh, they, they look similar. But um, bexiprazole is um, utilized in a, a similar way, but it also is approved for like adjunct therapy uh, for major depressive disorder as well. So that's one of the things that they uh, kind of bring up in the package labeling and whatnot. Same kind of adverse effects, um, agathesia being the one type of EPS that it does uh, is more likely to cause. Um, it does need to be dose adjusted based on renal function as well. And the price is a killer on because the brand name is Rexalti and it's Aripiprazole is a much cheaper option. Definitely um, see commercials for that one. Yeah. So it's the, one of those things that uh, if you are interested in like kind of how to use um, those in particular, we talk about it when we uh, go through the depression algorithm and talk about depression with anxious distress and mm-hmm. how we can kind of utilize those as adjunct therapy. Right. Uh, we also have a centipede branded as Saphirus. You're probably not going to see this one too much. Um, it's also available as a transdermal patch called Sequado. Um, but the uh, Saphirus brand is sublingual tablets. And it has a lower risk of metabolic effects um, uh, generally in as well as EPS. It's also Vralar, which you've probably seen on TV. Brain, uh, generic is uh, Cariprazine. It is used for schizophrenia um, and manic or mixed episodes associated with bipolar, bipolar type 1. Um, it has late occurring adverse reactions due to uh, accumulation in plasma levels, interestingly. So you wouldn't necessarily see them up front, but you can see them over time. Yep. Um where did you leave off? I was I was looking ahead. Uh, Fanapt, okay. Um And did you mention uh, the Vralar already? Yes. Okay. Um, so Vralar does. I will just to throw this out there. That's what I was looking at. Um, Vralar does have a little bit more receptor signaling. So they they actually it covers um, and is an antagonist at five HT two A and also five HT seven, which is mm. another one of those targets. So that's kind of a unique um, property of that one. Right. While also having that five HT one A D two D three. Um, agonism or partial agonism uh those um, at least the presynaptic so um all right so moving on to uh uh, you said FNAP was you left off. Mm-hmm. I can't even follow my own thinking notes. Um, Latuda is another um, second gen that's uh, a brand name only. Uh, this one also has 5-HT7 um, antagonism. And uh, it is, the one thing about it is it can cause activation of mania and hypomania in some patients. Um, it does it have uh, neurological um, adverse of, of reactions as well with patients that have dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's disease. Um, and it does need to be taken with food. Uh, it's not as vital as like the geodon that we're going to talk about in a second, but it, it does tend to, um, it needs food typically to be absorbed properly. At least at this, it is the dose that we would typically use. We'd have to overcome it with a higher dose, but you can't really do that with geodon, but um, Latuda just make sure they're having a meal with it. With, uh, with FNAPT, I didn't mean to mention it's uh, generic as iloperidine, but it can cause QT interval prolongation. It can cause preopism, but it has a lower risk of metabolic effects, EPS, anticholinergic effects, and sedation than some of the others. Gotcha. Oh, I see what you meant by left off. That's where we were starting. 
Let's go. We're not. We're, we're just not. We can't get our act together. By the end of the episode, it's, we'll be fine. It's the arms. Fall. It is the arms. It's throwing me off completely. I have like contort my head a little bit funny. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So olanzapine uh, is another one that we're probably all familiar with. Um, if you guys hear my dog barking, I'm sorry. Um, olanzapine is uh, one that is is actually a very effective second generation and his. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say antihistamine. I'm not with it today. Um, second generation antipsychotic, but is notorious for its metabolic uh, side effects. So it's got a super high risk of weight gain, um, occurrences of uh, glucose intolerance, dyslipidemia, um, metabolic syndrome in general. So it's definitely one of those that, depending on the patient's comorbidities, can be a real issue. Um, so it is great that it's effective, but then the side effects are hard to deal with. Um, there's also a, uh, a combination product with olanzapine now um, with samodorphin. Um, and that is supposedly supposed to help with... Um, the weight gain aspect of it. Uh, it doesn't, I haven't seen that it actually negates a lot of the other metabolic issues, but the weight gain, it does seem to help with. Um, so it's a little bit of a plus there, but that, that, uh, yeah, I haven't personally seen anybody actually on that yet. I'm sure the price is a lot more than generic lanzapine. I'd imagine so. I think we mentioned that in one of our new drug update yeah. episodes, Yeah, yeah. which might've been like a, a year ago or yeah. so. Man, we we give it one one you get one drug up in a year <laughs> and you get six drugs. So uh, quetiapine is another that um, is very commonly used. Now this one um, does have really strong affinity for the histamine one receptor as well. So sedation is definitely a, a cons- well a concern for some, and also in other patients may be actually a benefit. Used for sleep. Yeah, so if they have insomnia things like that, um, you'll see quetiapine being utilized uh, in those patients to kind of kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Yeah, just make sure it's two birds and not just sleep. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, and then also can cause um, hypothyroidism, QT uh, interval prolongation. and um, But it is it is a very low risk of EPS and movement disorders. There's like a moderate risk of metabolic issues. So that's another thing. It can cause weight gain. Um, but it's it's one of those that uh, it definitely has its, its use. Yeah, for sure. Um, one that you'll see a lot is Risperdal, Risperidone, of course. You can't say Risperdal without saying the most typical, atypical. It, it just goes hand in hand. Um, but it's potent um, at the D2 um, as far as antagonism goes, and then it's a serotonin 2 antagonist. Um, uh, so most typical, atypical. So it has EPS uh, symptoms uh, associated with it that's dose-related. Um, even at us- usual doses, it can cause them. Um, it probably has no advantage in patients requiring high doses of antipsychotics. Um, it has long-acting injectable formulations uh, that you may have heard of. Risperdal Consta is an intramuscular biweekly injectable. Um, Perseris is a sub-Q monthly injectable. And then Rikindi is another intramuscular biweekly injectable, which can be handy for some patients. Um, I think Rikindi just came out last month, right? That's the new one? That's the newest right. one? You know who... Um, you know who you see this a lot in? Hmm. Um, incarcerated. Mm. And the, the injectable or the Risperidone The, the long-acting. Mm. Uh, I guess the Risperidone too, but just these long-acting injectables in general, interestingly. Hmm. Um, we, we just got involved with it a little bit, so I've, I've seen it. Oh. Um, there's also Paliperidone in Vega. Um, the major active metabolite of Risperidone is what it is. Um, its, its profile, its pharmacologic profile, is similar to that of Risperidol. Um Paliperidone palmitate is in, uh, available as a monthly depot injection, and it's branded as Invega Sustena. And I think they have, uh, it's got a three-month and a six-month now as well, I believe they've added recently, or the six-month, I think it's six months. Six months. Um, it's the, yeah, that's, really the, that's what around. I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's the good stuff. The, uh, the, the the last two, um, so we have Ziprazidone or Geodon. Um, this one is probably the highest likelihood of causing issues with QTC prolongation. Um, it's usually one of those things that in a healthy patient is not a big deal, um, but if it's you know in being used in combination with other medications that can affect the QT interval, then that's, that's where it can be a problem. Um, also, uh, it does need to be taken with, when they say food, they actually specify a 500 calorie or more meal. So mm-hmm. it's really, really uh, important to take that one with food. Um, and then one of the newer kids on the, in the block, the Kiplita, uh, I, I see commercials for this one quite a bit, but uh, this is the the one I was talking about that has the D2 presynaptic partial agonist activity and then D2 postsynaptic 
antagonism and um, among other uh, receptor signaling as well. In fact, they, it uh, does have uh, antagonism at 5-HT2A, um, and then it goes after some other receptors like um, D1-regulated NMDA uh, and AMPA agonists. And so this it's got kind of uh, unique features to it. Um, it's a 3A4 substrate, so you got to watch out for drug-drug interactions and you know, this side effects as far as the anticholinergic effects and, and whatnot are still uh, going to be prevalent with that one as well. So one of the things I would say, if you're trying to like get an idea of, of how to kind of sift through all this, um, there's a lot of different resources out there as far as like charts that you can utilize. Um, basically, uh, it'll have a list. The, the, there's one that I have that is like a, has all the different antipsychotics, second gen antipsychotics on you know the the far left, and then across the top it has like EPS, um, specifically QTC prolongation, um, hyperprolactinemia, sedation, orthostatic hypotension, weight gain, glucose intolerance, lipid abnormalities, and then you can kind of see them ranked as far as very low, low, moderate, moderate, high high and you can kind of you know navigate it that way the way i tell my like pa students to memorize this is because no one's gonna i mean i should say no one i I, it'd be difficult to just memorize this verbatim i tell my students to kind of pay attention to the ones that have like the low and very low side effect profiles and the ones that are like moderate to moderate high or high um, side effect profiles you know which ones to kind of stay away from um, when it comes to comorbidities and things like that. And if you have a general idea of those, it, it is, and obviously you can always reference something like this as well, but it does um, make it a little bit easier to kind of know their place in therapy. I feel like if you have a general idea of like the lows and the highs of, of uh, side effect likelihood. So, so they need to pay attention to low, very low, moderate, high, and high. So I, like they, the, the chart that I have anyway has moderate highs, like kind of like a not almost high, but not quite, but there's a lot of them in the, in the middle oh, range. That there's are a lot moderate. of moderate ones yeah. that you can ignore. So it, in a gallon. Oh, in low moderate that you can, I understand. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I thought that was low to moderate. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it means the same thing. Yeah. I see. I just kind of made a new term. <laughs> so, yeah, the lows and the highs, this, and then kind of like the moderates, you know, you can get by with maybe. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that advice probably helped nobody now that I say it. No, it's good. <laughs> but, uh, no, that's that's kind of how I thought about it. And I will say um, one of the board certifications that I took, it, it did, like knowing that general idea of that chart was one of the things that saved me on the psych section um, because a lot of the questions were geared towards, you know, being able to utilize something like that. Side effects. They Come wouldn't even give me the chart. I had to raise my hand and everything. <laughs> they didn't give you the chart. Yeah, it was nonsense. I was like, excuse me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> He's moderating all the exams that could be given that day. I need a chart of the antipsychotics, please. He said chart. no. I need, um, the, I need the chemo man. I'm on my oncology <laughs> section. But uh, yeah, so there's uh, some some cool stuff coming out too. And I, I know we're um, basically out of time, but just to kind of mention... Um, let me pull these up real quick, just so you've at least heard of them. And I thought I had it right here. Um, there is a target um, called trace amine associated receptors, or TAARs. Um, there's a, a medication that is looking at um, that as a target, and there's another uh, medication that's looking at the muscarinic one and M1 and M4. Um, specifically uh, is, is targets as well. Um, they're all investigational. Um, one is the o- Ola uh, Tarant. That is the one that's the 5-HT1A and then the TAR1 um, receptor agonist. And then there's the xanomelene plus, tr- plus trospium combo for M1-M4 hmm. agonism. And then they use the uh, pimvisarin, um, and which is approved for like Parkinson's disease psychosis, but um, they're looking at it uh, in for schizophrenia as well. The new plasma mm-hmm. because it's a uh, inverse agonist antagonist at five HT two A. So you get some of the agonism, like the where it interacts with glutamate and whatnot. So you get a little piece of it. Um, uh, I'm sorry, it's an inverse agonist. So basically, meaning that not only are you blocking the effects, but you're actually causing the opposite of effects. I, I was started to say partial, like describe partial agonism, but inverse agonism means that you're not just getting a baseline, but you're actually pushing it further um, and right. doing the opposite of what the receptor normally does. So it really calms things down. So yeah, there's uh, some cool stuff in the pipeline. There's definitely others as well. Um, they're looking at a lot of the anti, um, or not anti, uh, some of the um, hallucinogenics, LSD, psilocybin, things like that, um, MDMA. So a lot of cool stuff in the uh, the psych world. Interesting. Yeah. Anything else uh, with 
any of these drugs or anything we got to mention? That's all I got. Is that all the antipsychotics? Uh, I'm sure. I mean, all know. the primary ones. Yeah, that I, yeah, that I can think of. <laughs> Off the yeah. top of our heads. Yeah. We didn't even look at a single note. <laughs> um, I got lost in my notes four, to- <laughs> four, four or five times. But, uh, yeah, so um, make sure you guys uh, go to freece.com. Uh, check out. if you, When you go to the, uh, the learn option, you'll see a drop down of, you know, live events, monographs, and then it'll say podcasts, and that's us. Yes, when you're logged in, you have to be when logged in. Yes, you do have to be logged in because it's only for unlimited members. It's, it's a very exclusive club. <laughs> it's an exclusive club. If you want to listen to us and get credit, you've got to be exclusive. <laughs> And so uh, make sure you check their uh, their stuff out. If you're not a, a free CE member already, check out their unlimited membership. It's a very cost-effective option to be getting a lot of good learning opportunities. And uh, thanks to them for, for partnering with us again. And um, if you guys have any questions for Cole or myself, the emails will be in the show notes. I'll leave a number you can text us at. And uh, also social media platforms are there. If you want more structured lecture style uh, material, we have a Patreon that has lectures from my the do for pharmacotherapy for my uh, PE students. Um, and they're broken down by disease state and uh, various pharmacology topics. And um, yeah, so it's patreon.com slash core consult rx. And it's like three dollars a month, I think, if you subscribe and you get access to all you get copies of the slides if you want to download those. And then you can pay like I think it's like thirty dollars and some change and you get a, a year's access. So I'd say it's one of the cheaper <laughs> review uh, programs out yeah. there. Mm-hmm. So check that out. And um, for those of you who already subscribed, really appreciate it. It helps us make the show better with equipment and costs and whatnot. So thank you guys so much there. And we'll see you all on the next episode. Have a great night.